And we're live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome here to Tropical Nomad. Every Monday is Speak Up Monday. So this is episode 324. Been going for like four years or more every single week. Uh, this week is a very important week, as every week is. And today is about the funding. The funding, uh, an incredible platform which brings together um, some of the best entrepreneurs, investors in Indonesia in like a Shark Tank style three pitch day. So it's a pitch event for three days, December 6, 7, and 8 at the new uh, Aria uh, Progressive Asian Restaurant over here in Batu Balig. Now, so today we have next to me uh, is, is Wayne Thompson, who founded originally uh, the, the, the founding, the funding, and also um, Biomia. For those of you who remember Biomia, the first business-to-business -business, uh, marketplace for Indonesia. So that's, that's Wayne. Next to him, we have a, a brother from, from, from a, probably the same mother but different father. So Mark Yannick Seaton uh, from Australia, who will be one of the, uh, the advisors and panelists uh, when it comes to this three-day pitching event. Then next to him, we have an Englishman, another Englishman, uh, Mr. Warren Burke. And, uh, and Warren also will be uh, a panelist giving some incredible feedback knowledge sharing uh, with some of these uh, wonderful entrepreneurs uh, coming for this pre-seed and seed uh, event, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to be a bit of musical chairs tonight. So we're going to um, also uh, get the viewpoints of those like uh, Mark and Wayne, uh, Mark and, and, and Warren, excuse me, Wayne also, to give you an, a, a good understanding of the type of and the caliber of people that we have who will be attending and that may also help you to still register to become a pitcher, all right? So let's start this off. So uh, Wayne, you're sitting right next to me. We'll start with you. So maybe um, if you can give a bit of background and history um, about the funding, uh, and then this will probably dovetail into a bit of background and history ab about you. Thank you so much, guys, for coming out. <clears throat> and Rob, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so I'll just jump right in. So the funding was created, uh, uh, I'll just summarize it. Uh, I was in New York, I flew back, and once I got back, it was in the heart of the pandemic, pretty much, and everything seemed so depressing. And uh, I just decided that um, I want to contribute in my own way, and um, that was the platform I decided to create, um, giving uh, local Indonesians the opportunity to um, not only pitch their product, but um, get the opportunity to showcase their talents and um, the businesses. And what we did find in the first event, uh, we did it, and uh, it was actually about 460 something applications from all over Indonesia. Uh, some people flew in uh, from just different parts, and uh, at that stage, we recognized how valuable the funding platform is. The problem was um, it, it, there was uh, multiple shutdowns uh, and stuff like that, so it was hard to maintain any consistency. So we decided to kind of hold off on that, and then once the time is right, then we roll out again, and thus the funding reloaded. And uh, a little bit about myself, I'm, I'm just, I say I'm a, a sucker for, for curiosity. I love um, to lean into uh, my passion. And the only way to discover passion, I think that's fluid, is simply just doing. And in that period of time, you recognize that, okay, this thing that I didn't ever thought about was something I really love. So um, I created Biomia, which is Indonesia's first and biggest B2B e-commerce marketplace. Think Alibaba merge with Esti. You guys are around. You see how talented the local artisans are here. And, um, you know, I was just taken back when there was not a platform curating all these products and then offering it up in a seamless way to the rest of the world. So we built that. Um, we soft launched. We're getting about 5,000 products uploaded to the site every month. And without any advertising or marketing and stuff like that, I think we're about 700 um, artisans now and about 20,000 products. And uh, yeah, we're just getting started, just getting rolling. And uh, yeah, look out for us. So that's a brief background. 
Mm. And look, just before you pass it on, on, on to Mark, I, I know it's, it's a bit like a hot mic. It's like, I'm done. Pass the mic on. But as you know here, we don't do things like that. We go a bit deeper. Um, so look, I obviously know you, Wayne, very well. So uh, in, what I think is good for people to hear, it, you know, you had some time in Silicon Valley. Um, so tell us a little bit about Cold, Cold Stone. Just so the guys get another. And then after that, we'll pass the mic on to Mark. A bit about your background. Okay, so I, I think that um, you know when you go on this entrepreneurial journey, of, of course, if it's in your blood, then normally, you know, you spot opportunities and you try to take advantage of it, right? So, one of the initial um, uh, companies that I work on is like pretty much Cold Stone Creamer, but that's a franchise, and I was the first person to kind of uh, saw that it would work well in New York State, so I brought it to New York State and grew it to about like 13 different locations. And then I just kind of sold it, and then I went completely from hot to cold. That's how my curiosity is so fluid. Yeah, so I I bought a um, paving company, so we build roads and bridges and stuff like that. Made it environmentally friendly and uh, rolled that out. And then um, Lehman Brothers collapsed, and I, I was forced to kind of fold that. But during that period of time. Um, you know, my other startup was a tech startup, and we sourced local or authentic um, uh, experiences. That was before Airbnb has ex had experiences, and uh, yeah, we exited that company and uh, yeah, just kind of went dark or low key for a while and just indulged in studying and knowledge, and uh, that's how I was able to kind of mm, get to this point. Mm. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And, and look, so pass on to Mark. See, the thing is with Wayne, right? So, uh, by the way, there's one other person missing. Uh, his name is, he has a few names, but Grover Anastasios, who uh, is another member of this initiative. So he comes uh, from the oil and gas industry. Uh, I guess the, the thing that, that made him quite special is that uh, he was working for both the Singaporean and the Indonesian governments, advising them on, uh, on how to acquire and how to move uh, and was doing the due diligence on sites to buy. It's a very creative guy, a great venture builder. Um, you'll see him at the event, uh, should you come. So one of the things which struck me about Wayne, I've known him for a very long time here in Bali, is that this guy is one of those people who has an incredible heart, as does Mark and Warren, right? But these people who, you know, he was already semi-retired, retired, right? This is what he won't tell you, but I will on his behalf. Um, so when he came to Indonesia and saw what was happening, and he didn't need to do anything, that's when he decided, he said, look, you know what, if I'm giving rice and I'm getting this kind of response and reaction from the people, then I must be able to do more. So then he came out of retirement to then set up the funding by EMEA and, and now invested everything we had into it. So now he's not going to retire for a little while, but because these things will work, like he'll, he'll retire better than he did before, but he's delayed that, right? So this is a sort of person that you're dealing with. And, and when it comes to uh, Mark, again, another guy I've known for like a while, another man with a beautiful heart, right? So, so this is really the theme, right? It's about entrepreneurs with a heart who have been there, who have had their successes and their learning experiences, but decide to come back and give something back, right? So, so, so Mark, without selling you up too hard, um, maybe what we start with is uh, tell people a little bit about your background, and then, then the next question will come. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. It's always good to be here. The last time I was here with Rob, it was um, completely dark. All the lights are off. We're in the middle of COVID. He's going to come for this amazing show, and it was just the two of us and one camera, and that was it. There was no one here. So having an audience is really nice. Um, yeah, lots of learning experiences, Rob calls them. Um, I had plenty of those, but I started off... Um, really, I started off with traveling. I think the, the, the leaving Australia and just traveling... Was, was really the, the main thing that opened up my eyes. And then just being an opportunist and following things that I love. You know, like I've got a very ADHD mind, so I love something for two, three years with all my heart. And then once I succeeded or semi-succeeded, I thought, okay, ready to move on. You know, like any challenge that you sort of finish, you're good. So I want to be a tennis pro. I kind of got pretty high up, but not really to the, you know, the most amazing bit. 
Um, I did a bit of stunt work, a bit of you know ski instructor in Switzerland, did a lot of heli skiing, and then got into the movie industry and, and worked with a lot of interesting people like Harvey Weinstein, and you know, so that was uh, certainly an interesting time. Um, you know, and, and so once I, once I sort of finished with the film industry, I, um, I spent a lot of time with my Burning Man friends, and, um, and I thought we'll build a platform to bring all these people together everywhere we go. And so that was a really fun thing, and I, I was able to build a great hotel booking platform at the same time. And now I've gotten kind of into real estate. So we're building four or five real estate projects around the world. We have our own private island in Turkey, which is going to be a lot of fun. You know, sort of my semi-retirement spot. And then, of course, in Bali, we're building a couple of resorts as well. Mm. So, yeah, it's um, anything that's interesting, I'll, I'll love to pursue, basically. And I love people who, who pursue their dreams. And so that's, uh, that's why I'd be thrilled to be on board. And did you want to mention Commune? Did I just mention Commune? <laughs> I, I kind of mentioned it last time I was here in the dark interview. Uh, the commune is just, um, it's kind of like, it, it's like an introduction to all the best, you know, most interesting people in every city you go to. So we're in 125 cities. It's an invite only. Every single person is verified. Elon Musk will be happy to know. There are no strangers whatsoever. And we, and we basically, um, you know, when somebody comes into any city, you know, whether they go to Stockholm or to London or to Bali, they basically say, hey, Mark, you know, do you have somebody who's in this industry or that industry? So after hearing that for about 10 years, I thought, I'm just going to do this app and bring all these people together. So that's really what the commune is. Love it. Thank you, my brother. And look, Warren, mate, um, over, over to you, maybe a little bit of background, uh, you know, what, what makes you tick, uh, what you do, why you do it? Uh, to be honest, it's always a, a kind of a difficult question because, you know, we, I've kind of done many things on this entrepreneurship journey, right? The way I always kind of describe it is professional problem solver. Um, I absolutely love going to small companies, large companies, and the different problems that they could have is they either have a tech stack that the product market fit is not right anymore. Maybe they need to bring more money in. Maybe they need to cut budget. So I love working with you know SMEs as well as large corporations and kind of helping get a path jump to market, but to profitability, right? So monetization really is something that I really enjoy. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity for joining the panel with the, 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 the funding. Um, it really is kind of a... Uh, something that's always been on a bucket list, right? To help other young entrepreneurs. I've just never really had an outlet for that. So thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I guess my kind of journey began uh, really in university. I was working towards film studies, um, kind of film theory, a bit more on the philosophical side, philosophical, philosophy side for the academic of film, uh, as well as film technology. Realized that industry was not going to be profitable for me. So I thought, how can I take these skills? And then it was video games, right? Back then, you know, 2010-ish, uh, video games were still kind of on the verge of, is it art? Is it, you know, media product? What is it? Is it just a waste of money for these parents, etc.? cetera? Um, so I taught myself how to code back then, went to the university, almost begged them for a place, dropped out. My parents were like, oh, this is, you know, what are you doing? I was like, trust me, trust me. Um, and then graduated from the university, saw the top 15% nationally with the distinction, um, first grade with honors, um, top 15% of all degrees nationwide in about 2014. My dissertation actually was on um, how entrepreneurs or digital entrepreneurs earn real world money from you know, virtual economies. So obviously with this whole play to earn Web3 thing, it kind of was a perfect product fit. I was sharing it out. I mean, look, I predicted this seven, seven eight years ago. Um, my parents were entrepreneurs. My mother was uh, in the textile industry. She was in the beauty industry. My father was in finance, retail, merchandise. So I think I've always had that blood. Um, one thing I think it is worth sharing, and I try and teach this to like friends that have kids. When I was probably, I don't know, eight years old till I was like 18, whenever me and my father would be in the car and he'd see a commercial space for him, he would say, what business would you put there? And I'm eight, nine years old, and I would say, a fish and chip shop or a dry cleaners, and he'd say, yeah, but there's a dry cleaners down the road, or you know, there's a fish and chip shop nearby, why? And I'd be like, oh, I'd do like an Indian fish and chip shop or a Chinese chippy, and we'd poke holes in each other's ideas, right? So from a very young age, he really brought me up of being a critical thinker, right? And I think that's what played into like the philosophy of the film studies and that kind of problem solving aspect was really drilled into me from a young age. Um, I had a video game studio while I was at university. Um, we won the Microsoft Imagine Cup finals. Um, uh, we got to the third place, actually. We didn't win. We, we got to the finals, I should say. When the Microsoft is your innovation award, Barclays Design Innovation Award, sold my shares, moved to China to set up a new game studio. Everyone was like, you don't know anyone. You're a white guy. You don't speak Mandarin. And I'm like, yeah, but I've got some money. And back then, everyone's like, this is China, bro. You know, everyone's got money. You're not special. I'm like, okay. 
So then took a job with the game publisher, built the network up that way, and then kind of discovered NFT, you know, like a crypto kiddies back in like 2015. And we were like, this is something special. I really have to start looking at, the, you know, blockchain technology and smart contracts. And obviously living in China where there's a lot of censorship, having an honest internet is something that really attracted me, right? Um, so then since then, I've gone on to, you know, exit several projects, gave a TED talk in Guangzhou. Um, before I left, I actually got on stage in front of 5,000 Chinese influencers and government ministers and said, you're, not, you're gonna control your own data. The governments and these companies cannot track you, which was not the smartest idea, I think, <laughs> on a stage in China. So a few months later, swiftly moved to Vietnam um, and then was there for a couple of years. And then there was a very small gap of the, the Bali window where I could move, right? So I came over, didn't know anyone. There was, I couldn't access any Web3 community here. I was just a brand new guy. Everyone kind of looked at you as like still a tourist. Um, and then that's when we, we kind of started Offchain Bali. Um, so Offchain is a global community. We're in 60 plus cities now, not as strong as Commune, but we're getting there hopefully. Um, and the idea is basically it's a, you know, it's a free community that you can just tap into. Um, if you need marketing services, developers, you need connections to different exchanges, you know, you just want opinions from a community. There's various different groups, you know, trading groups, NFT groups, et cetera. Um, so it gives you a bit of a base no matter where you go, right? Okay. And, um, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling anyway. No, but all, all very relevant because people get the, your energy, get you, right? And that's really what this is about. Um, so Mark, if I ask you, you know, apart from the fact that, that I asked you, I, I, what is it, <laughs> arm behind your back, Mark, would you care to join the funding? Sure, Rob. <laughs> um, why, yeah, why would you join something like this as a panelist? And um, what inspires you to, to, to help or to support other people, entrepreneurs? Uh, well, obviously, I think it's, um, I mean, anything that Rob does, I always say yes to. You know, he could say, come over for Halloween and we'll do, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put holes in pumpkins. I'll say, yeah, sure, come. It's, um, look, the, the, the major, major thing is that, I mean, I love that show, The Shark Tank. Obviously, everybody wants to be a judge one of these days. But for me, it's also about, you know, meeting all the young entrepreneurs and seeing what's going to happen and, and where we're going, what are the new ideas, and, and how we can kind of help those people to find their way. I mean, it's the dream that everybody has, is that you're going to be the person who's going to fund, you know, the next great company. And, and I think that would give us a lot of satisfaction. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. And look, so what I'd like to do, because you guys are going to get really, really hot. So we'll play some musical chairs now. So, so your time is done. You've done so well. Thank you very Feel much. free to step off. Leave the microphone on the chair. We'll get Josie. You want to come up? Sarita, cool. So we have Josie here, and then and then uh, then uh, and Sarita. After that, we'll have Alex and Giuliano. If if, he, if he's still up, where are you going, Wayne? <laughs> You're staying up here. <laughs> he thought he was getting away. So what happens when when you come close to time? You don't get out that easily. <laughs> right. So so look. Uh, so, two more. So uh, Josie, uh, again, another woman who who I really respect. Uh, Met you here in Bali, another parent, uh, and obviously my, my, my wife and you know each other and our kids know each other, you know, so that's wonderful. But maybe I think it would be really nice um, for people to hear a little bit from you. You're going to be a panelist as well uh, coming up, but maybe tell people, you know, like uh, a little bit about you, right? Where you come from, how you feel about things and uh, how you uh, can see that this entrepreneurial journey is, is one that you like to support. So, um, born and raised in Sweden, um, moved to south of France, I think around 19 years old. And I've always been inspired by people and different nationalities and how, you know, how to... Everyone's, everyone is so different from all over the world, so we can teach each other so many things. And enhancing people and businesses and entrepreneurs has always been a passion. So I started to work in public relations and I went into creative strategies in human architecture and how to actually enhance people, businesses through mindset, body languages, how to become your goal, questions to ask, exit strategies, how to you just you know, thrive in life and businesses. So it's always been a passion for me. And then I came to Bali 20 years ago and I started real estate development. I needed a little break of energies so it was a great mix of working with people eight months a year and then doing real estate development on the other side. So that's kind of a little bit of my story. And I think this idea, it's pretty amazing. 
I think in this world we have to know where we can enhance each other and help each other out. And there's so many amazing people with ideas and visions that need to be um, put out there. And if we can help them create a setting and mindset with investors, what you guys are doing on the show to help you know, this world become a better place, I think it's beautiful. And look, I know you don't need to give it all, all the way, but you're due to meet one of the ministers. I think you got a photo recently with the president of Indonesia, with, with Jokowi. So if you look at her Instagram, you'll see her next to this uh, other very handsome man. And, uh, and yeah, so you're meeting one of the ministers, uh, either you have or you're about to. And uh, now I know that you can't say too much about the project, but is there anything you can tell us about the project that you're working on? Because I think it's phenomenal. We are, we are working on, uh, yeah, not too much though. <laughs> <laughs> we put them on the spot here. That's what we do. That's what you do. Come on. It's a real estate project combined with innovative technology, human architecture, and uh, lifestyle, a new lifestyle that I think the world is becoming today. That we, we are already there. We're just going to show them how we should actually live it in the future where having a house becomes a liability and not an asset. So it's, um, I'm not sure it. if I said too much, but yeah. You it's know what? I got a sense of what it is and I hope you didn't say too much, but thank you. I really appreciate it, right? Now look, Sarita, now Sarita, you're, um, you're what, what I call like a, a Bali coincidence, right? So, so that means that we haven't actually met before. Uh, and I know you mentioned that, that you worked on Shark Tank or something. So can you tell us a little bit about your, 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 your background and then we'll get into some of the pros and cons that you found about Shark Tank. Cool, okay, I'll, I'll try to make it not too long. So my name is Sarita. Um, I'm born in uh, Macedonia in Germany. And my dad is actually from North Carolina, so I have all of these aspects in my life. And um, I um, had a problem myself with my foot, and I couldn't find the right product for it. So I kind of stepped into um, yeah, research and development, and just started you know, to create those toe separator socks, which haven't existed yet. So yeah, so I was in the doing for one year, two years, and I was ready to kind of launch my, pro my project, but then it turned out that I have a medical product. I was like, no, it's not a medical product. It's just lifestyle. They was like, no, you're moving bones. So here are the things you have to do if you want to import a medical product. And I was like, okay, great. So, and then in Germany, I mean, you must have known, like, Europe is so hard, like, with regulations and stuff. And I was absolutely not prepared. But all of a sudden, I kind of made it, went almost broke, invested all my money, you know, cut all my insurances down and put all the money in there. And I was like, okay, so this is like before product launch. I was like, okay, so how am I going to get my money back now? So I was like, okay, there's only one chance. I'm going to go to Shark Tank, Germany. So I went there by myself super nervous, um, and then uh, went to the pitch. So what you usually do uh, see on, on TV is like this 10 to 15 minutes pitch, but nobody actually knows that it's about, what do you guys think, how long is the pitch on Shark Tank in real? Shout it out. Five minutes, no. Nope. One, minute. one minute, nope. An hour. Three. Three minutes. Three minutes, like in real one. time. So let's say Sony will cut it later on. So usually the pitch on TV is 10 minutes. So what do you think, how long are you, are the entrepreneurs re um, recording together with the, with the shark or dragons behind the scenes? 30 days. 30, 30 minutes, okay. Do I hear, there you go. It was exactly three hours, which was so crazy. And I was so nervous. And um, yeah, so the pitch was three hours. I got two, two offers. Uh, decided to go with one investor, that was 2019, and then COVID hit, yes. So yeah, all the wholesalers closed down. It was a very rough learning, as you, as you would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, we are still existing and I'm super happy, super proud, yeah. Wow. So a round of applause, <laughs> I feel like a round of applause are in order, right? 
Wow. Thank you. Shark Tank Germany. Julian, you're on next, by the way, as Germany came up. We're going to get Julian, who's, who's uh, set it a record by being on the show like four or five times. So, you know, um, so you mentioned before, right, three-hour show. By the way, um, what we're going to do on December 6, 7, and 8, there's no three hours, yeah? You're going to have between five to 15 minutes. We'll, we'll work it out. But it won't be three hours, in case you're wondering. That's number one. Um, but maybe the question that comes up, being that you had this real-world experience, you know, is there anything that you would have done differently to prepare for yeah. that? Yeah, let me get my list. Um, yeah. <laughs> Somebody with the catalogue right here? Uh, yeah, so. Maybe give us your top so, three. Okay. Um, so, first of all, yeah, better research on the investors, what they can actually do for your brand or your product. That's one thing. Second, when it comes to negotiations, um, you don't see negotiations on the pitch, actually. So make sure whatever amount of uh, percentage you are giving away, um, you do know what they mean. So when it comes to uh, negotiation and how they may, you know, like go for second round investments, etc., make sure you know all of these things before you go on Shark Tank. Love it. Thank you, my darling. Uh, just gr welcome. great, great to meet you, Sarita. You have a great energy, great warmth about you, and obviously gorgeous. So thank you so much. Yeah. More than happy. <laughs> welcome. And look, Wayne, uh, is there anything coming up uh, coming up for you at, at the moment? If if there's not, we can go. We can go straight. But just wondering, what's stirring in your mind? I think you should just go straight. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to go straight. So, um, uh, Josie, is there anything uh, left that you like to share before we do a bit of musical chairs again? You're good. One for round of applause for these two. Sarita, one second. Hold those applause. One more thing. Yeah. All right. So, um, any suggestion, let's say, on, a, on, a, on the positive side when it comes to, let's say, pitching is, um, I've realized when I went there, I have a niche product, and people did not understand the pain of the people who, who have actually that problem. So, once you know your target group and you, you're pitching in front of investors, make sure they understand what your product is doing for the society or for your clients, because this is the most valuable part. So not just, a, um, uh, what is it called, a point of interest, but also that the, the person you're pitching to really understands where you're coming from and really understands the target where you're gonna like project the, the, the numbers later on. So I think that's a very important point that people People do not get the product and then investors would step back and in order to avoid that, be prepared that you're speaking to a five-year-old child, explaining the product and then you're kind of safe. Love it. Thank you so much. Round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, let that go. So, you put the mic friends on the chair. Thank you. Mind your step. Mind the lights on the way. So, we'll get Giuliano to sit over here and brother Alex, are you ready? So Julian here, then then, then, then Alex with the with the kimono. Wayne, you done or you wanna <laughs> you want you want you want to take a break? You 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 go and dry off a little bit. All right, cool. So we're gonna move this. Yeah, come over here. All right, looking around for that for that one person. Who would it be? Okay, I think. Uh, come a little you know what? I, I you think Julian should come closer? I think so. Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah, I know. I know. All right. So, all right, we, we have two more. So, two wonderful men I've known for like, uh, you have known for many years. Alex is a recent, uh, <laughs> a recent uh, friend. A recent hire. A recent hire. <laughs> so, uh, so we, with Julian, uh, many of you here uh, would know uh, if you're in Bali, uh, Julian is, uh, is a guy who, if I say that he likes to live life, I think that would be an understatement, number one. Number two, which he'll tell you, comes from a very deep um, experience uh, working at the highest end of raising capital, uh, working with countries, and, and also being at the, the, the not-so-nice result of that also, but then finding a way to come back and say, you know what, how can I prioritize life in a way that I'm enjoying what I'm doing and making a return, 
which I think is a crucial thing when it comes to entrepreneurs and you know how to create that balance, right? So we'll get to that. And then with, with, with Alex, the thing which I always say and smile about is that so <laughs> Alex was introduced by a mutual friend, uh, has been, uh, again, in capital raising and uh, investing and, and all this stuff for many years, which we'll explain. But the thing which makes me smile about you is that when I saw his LinkedIn profile, uh, the picture was of this aggressive guy, like, you know, shirt, the tie, and you could see that this guy wasn't happy. Whoever he was, this guy, the guy was... And look what Bali has done. No. Look what Bali has and done. And then after about a month of being in Bali, like, I look at the profile picture, I look at him, it's like a before and after, right? Bad movie, good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Bad movie, good movie. So, so then uh, I call him Kimono Alex because uh, he likes to wear kimonos and he bought the company. <laughs> so I call, him, I call him Kimono Alex. So I think, again, you know, it's about how do we um, knowledge share you know, the things that maybe have been the toughest for us, which other people are struggling with as well, and how we found our way to it. So I'll start with you, Brother Julian. Uh, if you could give maybe a brief uh, rundown of your experience and history and what you're doing now. Um, I mean, what I do now is I try to retire, which is not working so well. Uh, I've got a beautiful wife and two little children here in Bali. So we live probably the best life of my life. So that's, that's why we're here, and, and it's important not to forget that. But uh, I've also already been on sh uh, Shark Tank as well in China. I want Something you don't know about me, I want Shark Tank China. Uh, five years ago, which is called Fight for Your Dreams, and it is 45 minutes live. Wow. And I sang at the end of it. I <laughs> took the guitar and we sang, you raise me up, 200 million Chinese people. I thought nobody would ever watch it. And then I came back to Los Angeles and everybody said, like, you raise me up. But, oh, geez. That's not the, but a little bit of my background, um, I, I moved to New York, was very, very young. I was initially an artist, then I figured out that being poor didn't really work for me so well. So I went a little bit more into banking, quit banking, and moved to Africa. So I worked for the Germans in Ethiopia to build infrastructure and, and bring power waste solutions to rural Ethiopia in the border region to Eritrea. And then figured out, wow, this is going to be very expensive. I need more cash. And the Germans said, I give you some cash if you bring some more cash from somewhere else. And so I started raising money again. I, I left the bank, I left investment banking to change the world. And then all I did pretty much for the last 14 years was raising money. And I did an initial seed round, then 2016, we did, 2006, God, that's long ago, we did a 57 million seed round, uh, which was a huge amount of money for Germany, from McLean Perkins, Wellington Partners, some of the biggest VCs, which then became my, my bosses for the next five years, which was an excruciating experience. I would never want to do that again for anything in my life. So I've gone through the whole thing, and just long story short, I, I really believe that, that the solutions to modern society and to our problems will come from technology and it will come from entrepreneurs. I don't believe in big companies. I don't really believe in government. I'm kind of one of them, so I really don't believe in government that much. So I think if we're going to solve our problems in waste, energy, you know, population, feeding a global population of 8 billion people is going to come from smart entrepreneurs. And if I can contribute just a little bit through my, you know, kind of painful and, and joyful experience of the last decade, probably raised about $160 million at this point, then I'm more than happy to share that information. And, and maybe it's, you know, help somebody else make it a little bit easier and build a great company. You know, and, and like, it, it would be like terrible of me not to mention about your latest project, right? So Liv, can you, can you, can you talk about that? Are you able to? Are you allowed it's, to? It's my, my thing. I, you know, I'm not very good at keeping secrets anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm not the biggest master of non-disclosure forms and everything else. No, I came up uh, with an idea while we were here in Bali because I think we all had an incredible experience during COVID. You know, everybody left. Everybody was stressing out. Um, it was a lot tougher to make money from here. We couldn't go to business meetings anymore. I was cut off from Silicon Valley. Everything else, we had to do everything online. But we had built an incredible community. Um, I had the best time of my life. We met amazing people. We grew together as a community. And looking back now, I'm, I'm 46 years old. If there's something I really missed living in California, living in Los Angeles, living in Tokyo, in London, all these places, we never had a community. Everything was transactional. And if there's really true wealth, I think, for anybody personally, is being part of a community that's more important and bigger than you are. And now, because I know how to raise a bit of money, I got the opportunity to catch some larger pieces of land, and I'm building my own city. 
uh, out in Sumbawa. I know it's, it's and uh, hope that 1,000 cool people will join me there and build an incredible zero carbon, zero waste, fully renewable, fully integrated community that's kind of demonstrate what we can achieve as human beings if big corporations and governments don't stand in our way. Nice, nice. Woo! I know it's like, of the thousand people, you can, you can, you can take off about 30. They're like, yeah, we're volunteers there. Volunteers, we're yeah, ready yeah, yeah, to yeah. sign up. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're like, can I sign up? All I see, there's no volunteers. The hands are going up already. It's like, come on, there's no volunteers. Love it, love it. But Alex, my man, so, so same for you, man. Um, you know, like, like maybe a bit of your background, uh, you know, how you find your way here and why you feel that helping, supporting uh, the next wave of, of entrepreneurs and those who are existing but maybe need to recalibrate um, maybe tell us a bit about that, but your, your background first. Sure, thanks, uh, Robert. So, um, hey everybody, my name's Alex Kodak. I'm uh, from Canada, um, born and raised in Toronto. Uh, I've been in a primarily management consulting for the better half of a 22-year career, last nine years in my own two companies. I had a uh, management consulting company in Canada where I was advising financial service clients and uh, also advising companies on uh, growth capital and how to enter new markets. Here I came to Bali after um, probably one of the most challenging projects I've ever had in my life, needed to hit the reset button, and uh, essentially thought about how I could serve and what do I want to do uh, on the back nine of, uh, of my career. And uh, I thought there's, there's really no better way to make an impact on this world than to help improve the economic prosperity and quality of life of those coming after us. And uh, there's a number of ways that we can do that. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reasonably focused on that and also on uh, regenerative uh, projects as well. How do we heal the planet? How do we put capital to work to, uh, to make the world a better place? So those are my uh, two primary areas of thrust. Um, I've done, uh, I've had just, you know, such a blessed career. I've had uh, the opportunity to work with some of the most brilliant minds uh, in the world. Uh, M M M MIT. I yeah, I was, uh, so worked with uh, the founders of the uh, Media Lab at MIT, uh, where they had a city science initiative and uh, brought it to Toronto. Um, we did a number of projects in Toronto around that program. And it was all about introducing urban interventions into how to improve city life. And you would say, well, what's an inter urban intervention? And it's things like how do um, autonomous shared use electric vehicles improve people flow th through a city? How can you use uh, mobility data to uh, highlight uh, financial risk or security risk or health risk in a population? Uh, how can you structure living, living arrangements uh, like, um, prop like uh, apartments that would uh, robotically change and transform uh, during time of use, time of day? So it exposed me to so much, and I got a chance to, uh, to use some of that expertise here in, uh, in Bali. And uh, you know, Robert, you, you asked a, a really good question about uh, a few minutes ago, and that is, um, you know, what, can you, what can you say to people that you've learned in your career that, uh, that, that you would like to bring forward so that, so that people can kind of pay attention and learn from that? And uh, there's, uh, there's, there's some really hard lessons in being an entrepreneur. And I've had the privilege of advising um, a number of really amazing entrepreneurs. Um, but one of those lessons that I've learned and that I'm so grateful for is when do you walk away? When do you walk away from the project? So I've had, I've had, the, I've had the, the, the privilege of um, advising a country. I think you mentioned that you had some of that experience as well. And they were looking to get into um, the legal cannabis sector. Uh, cannabis is legal in Canada. And, uh, I was very well connected to the um, members of parliament that, that brought that legislation forward and, uh, and so could speak with authenticity and integrity on how it could stimulate um, development in a country. And uh, I brought it to another country and literally had a hedge fund with $10 million in their hand say, okay, we're ready. All we need to do is move the money over to the account and you guys are good to go. And before we did this, I did a secondary set of background checks just on the partners because the hedge fund 
is not only a federally regulated institution, one of the guys that ran it is a friend, and I just wanted to make sure that the deal was super clean and we weren't gonna run into problems later on. And uh, needless to say, I'm really, really glad I did that because uh, something turned up with one of the partners that was a little bit offside and we couldn't move forward. And uh, I'm glad that we didn't, you know? So I wouldn't want to expose my friends, my career, my integrity to something that would fall short and, you know, ruin lives. And, and now you look at what's going on with FTX and you kind of think, you know, where was I? I'd like to be <laughs> on that advisory board. But it's, it's kind of like you, you get exposed to these experiences and uh, they, they tell you, you know, when you should walk away. There was, there was something recently where I was, I was working on a, on a, I was advising a client who had just a brilliant, brilliant vi vision for a, a very, very large venture. And uh, we, we did this deal and, and I was literally going to make a ton of money from this deal, I got to tell you. But after a few weeks of getting in there, it became abundantly obvious that they just weren't ready. You know, there was, there was, there was something about the promise not meeting the deliverable. And there was something about an ability to execute that just wasn't there. And I, I couldn't feel confident representing that to an investor community. And had I tried to wing it and probably could have got some checks written, if things blew up later, you know, how does that look to me? How does that look to the project? How does that look to the ecosystem around us? So, so I, I say this and I bring this up because it's exciting and, uh, you know, it's, it's emotional and it appeals to the ego, this business that we're in. But, but let's, let's act with integrity. Let's act with uh, a conscious and let's, let's be good stewards of, um, of each other. And, uh, and let's respect the planet and each other. So that's uh, really what I want to say. And thank you, my brother. Woo! Yeah, another moment. Well, 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 now as you went there, I have to go here. So, uh, so before we play musical chairs for the last time, and he doesn't even know that I'm going to call him up. <laughs> Can't wait to see his reaction. Um, so of all of the experience that you've garnered over the years, Giuliano, like uh, for entrepreneurs, maybe two sets. One, which are maybe just coming up. Another who has spent a period of time, their business is established, but they need to get to that next place. Um, kind of what advice or what nugget of wisdom, if we call it that, could you give to each based upon what you've seen and experienced? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, obviously it's, 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 a, it's a big subject, right? Raising money and, and a lot of entrepreneurs, just because you have a great idea and you have a great company doesn't mean that you're great at raising money. Actually presenting and pitching to a room full of assholes is a very different skill set than building an incredible company. You know, sometimes it aligns, you know, with me, I'm, <laughs> I, I like to be in a sorry, room full sorry, of assholes. Uh, <laughs> Most people here are smiling, by the way, not because we're they rude. They know it's true, right? Because it's we kind of know it's true, but except, except, the, fu except the funding. No, 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 no assholes there, just no. between us. If you don't like assholes, stay out of venture capital. I mean, it's really, it's, I know they can say don't get, but it's, it's yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. Just because you have a great company doesn't mean necessarily that venture capital, all of this is really viable for you to begin with. If you're a nice person, probably better to just stay out and build your company otherwise. Um, also, another major thing I've experienced, I see so many people that, that are actually getting past that hump of raising their first money. And then they think, no, their problems will go away. I have some money. No, no, no. The more you raise, the bigger your problems get. And so that is really something that a lot of people are not prepared for. That, like, oh, I raised a million dollars, my problems are over. Say, so your problems are getting 10 times worse every day now. All right? So um, that's something. The third thing, really, when it comes to, to pitching, because I still pitch, right? I still have a waste to hydrogen company that still needs capital. We're still getting out there. We're actually turning the waste of Paris into hydrogen right now, which is pretty cool. But so I still, I, I'm, I still pitch. And what I see from a lot of other entrepreneurs, I've been on stage for 23 years, right? I've done 5,000 pitches. I have hosted as a venture capitalist, I don't know, hundreds myself. I've done pitch classes, and I still see people that walk into that meeting and that have people in there that are, you know, have billion-dollar funds, and they look at their pitch deck like they've never seen it before in their life. And then they're reading it like it's some kind of awkward Chinese prescription that's probably going to make you sick, and then expect people at the end to say, wow, that's amazing, let me give you money. 
So literally taking, raising money is almost a full-time job. It has become definitely 80 to 90% of what I've been doing. So if you love your business, don't become a professional fundraiser because you're never going to see it again. You know, so it's a full-time job. It takes massive um, preparation. It is incredibly competitive. I mean, I don't know what you take. is maybe 1% to 2% of the companies that go out to raise money actually ever raise enough money to build their companies. Um, your risks go up. And it's, it's really hard work, and it's a different skill set. And so just prepare really, really wisely. Know what you want from your investors. Don't just walk in there and think they're going to answer your questions. And they're going to, they're not, I once lost my entire company, you know about that as well, from a, from a big hedge fund, because, you know, these are not nice people. It's war. And I think that's really something that great <coughs> entrepreneurs um, underestimate. And I think I've seen it kill incredible startups that by the end there was one financial investors say, hey, I can do the whole thing better, kicked out the founders, which might have 2% left at, at, you know, at, a, at a C round, they have nothing left, so they have nothing to say, they get thrown out, they make no money, and the company dies. So if you really want to build a great company, be very, very careful of who you bring on board. Don't raise money you don't need, and if you need that money, which is incredible if you get it, go like all out and make sure that it works and that you keep your business in line with your own vision because it's not a buddy relationship, right? We're not out there to be friends with venture capitalists. Their job is to optimize their position at a potential exit and not to change the world, make something better and believe in your cause. And their job just got a heck of a lot harder in the, in the past few weeks as opposed to last year. Exactly. Everybody could make money, but uh, now it's getting rough. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I mean, just, just think about that for a second, right? So um, in Indonesia, you can buy yourself a 30-year government bond. It'll yield 7.4%, uh, right? That's called the risk-free rate of return. It's, it's basically free money, right? You could come up with the capital, you get it back. Uh, if you want to make that money back in uh, the equity markets right now, you're looking at uh, 12% at least right, in order to make a, a viable case. And now in venture capital, uh, we're looking at an IRR of about, what, 24, 25%? Multiples, is, not yeah. multiples. I need a 20 time multiple. I, I know you need a 20 time. Everybody wants a 20 time multiple. But, but, but for the fund itself, you want to you oh. get an IRR of about 25%, yeah? Overall, minimum. Yeah, then yeah. You suck. Exactly. So the point, the point that I'm saying is that the job is getting higher, er, getting a lot harder in the, uh, in the current capital markets environment. That's, that's the basic point. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Round of applause. We'll play some musical chairs for the last time. You can leave, leave the mic from there. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, brother Alex. Appreciate it, guys. All right. So, so uh, uh, Wayne, are you still here or has he, di or has he disappeared? <laughs> All right. So the last person that I want to call, Bradley. That's right, mate. Come up and join me. Come up, come up, come up and join me. So, Bradley, I'd like to come up. Mine, mine, knows, mine knows this there. You can come and grab a seat here. So you're welcome. So Sister Ayu, maybe uh, if we can take the chairs out. Oh, Wayne's here. Great. All right, we take one chair. What one chair out? Yeah. Great. Awesome. Awesome. All right, and we'll recenter it. Great. So look, um, a few things which I just want to uh, clear up. So we have Indonesian uh, investors. We have Indonesian um, partners who can give advice. I had a number of them coming tonight, uh, but there's an another event. One is stuck in on the other side of Indonesia, Agung, uh, who we've had on the show recently. He's uh, uh, the vice chairman of Kadin Bali, and, and Kadin, as you know, um, is a Chambers of Commerce uh, for Indonesia, 514 locations throughout Indonesia. They were the ones who basically created, um, who um, ran the B20 uh, and the B20 was obviously a huge part of G20, massive. So Agung is an incredible guy because um, he, uh, for me, marks like this new uh, collaboration and cooperation uh, with expats, foreigners, locals, um, to really, um, all ships rise with the tide, right? To really embrace that on a deep level. There's also Janur, uh, Plastic Exchange. He won uh, CNN Hero, uh, as you probably know. Uh, and there's, there's three others, which I won't mention their names right now. And also we have some incredible women as well, which are coming on. Today you've seen, I think, the ratio of like maybe one to three. 
I think we had two panels of guys and one panel of women, but we have some incredible women joining us as well um, that couldn't attend tonight. So look out for that also. So as, a, as we begin to close, the reason um, Bradley uh, here, but another Englishman, there's, there's Warren before, anyway, this is good. So what I'd love um, for, from you, um, and you may be playing a small role, let's see, um, but give people a bit of a background on, on, on your history in entrepreneurism, and then what we'll do is we'll get into a few uh, of those wonderful nuggets that you think might be a good time uh, to basically share with people. Sure. Um, my background is super unconventional. Um, I was basically in the music industry. Uh, my first venture was as a teenager uh, putting on club nights for under-18s in over-18 venues. Um, I got the money to do it from giving guitar lessons to uh, kids my age or a bit younger. And uh, yeah, like, you know, teenagers don't really have a place to go and they want to go where they think is cool. So that was my first, um, my first entrepreneurial activity. And uh, yeah, basically spent 20 years in the music industry and um, for the last five years or so have been, you know, investing in, in different sorts of things from real estate to uh, crypto um, and a little bit of venture and have no background. Now, mate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot just a little bit. Uh, you know what? Everyone has come up tonight. As if I wasn't on the spot I know, already. I know. It's funny, right? Because uh, a few of the guys, Mark, Alex, we've got a few of them over here, Josie, and obviously Sarita. It was funny because when they get up here, it's like, okay, they're going to ask me maybe a question or two, but the questions come through me, not from me, right? It's, it's the excuse which I always use, but it's true. And Warren, you did, Warren, you killed the game. You're great. Um, so the music industry, what were some highlights for you? Because you skipped over that one, but there are a few things that you did that were quite outstanding that you're kind of so missing. I, um, I, I was a creative in, in music, so producing and ran a studio. Um, and, you know, during my time as a producer and, and engineer, had some, some hit records in the UK with a band called Pendulum and a band called Chase and Status. Um, you yeah, it. and you know, did a, did a stint at, uh, uh, for EMI at Abbey Road, um, and then went to Los Angeles and was recording a lot of studios there as well. So yeah, it was mainly on the creative side, but um, as I said, I've had a very unconventional career and, and tr tried to make opportunities you know, the best I could uh, with what I had at the time, uh, not always in a traditional or correct way, but just uh, I, honestly, like a lot of learning from mistakes. Um, and actually, um, I, I, I'm in a deal now, which is just coming to the end, which I think is going to be quite successful. And I feel like it's um, the culmination of a lot of failures that has uh, brought that about in, in many respects. So, yeah. And then, you know, on that failures, which I think is a huge topic and a really important one to address, you know, so if people maybe were maybe in one of two positions, so maybe in the startup position or in the position of, you know, established business but don't want to make a mistake, so maybe are holding themselves back. So what advice um, would you give to those two sets of entrepreneurs based upon what, what's happened to you? I think... One of the best things you can do is is fail and fail quickly. And I, th I know that there's like a culture and a narrative around that. But like if you're in something that isn't going to work, it's better to find out now than to find out five years from now. Um, so that may be to the, you know, the entrepreneur just starting out. And the person who um, is maybe, you know, in something uh, more established and, 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 you know, kind of um, scared of making a mistake, um, it was the Oscars, uh, I think, last night or the night before, and um, Diane Warren, who's a very famous songwriter, behind tons of hits, including like um, Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith. And, I mean, she's probably written 100 number ones. Anyway, um, she got awarded uh, an Oscar for Best Song after 13 um, times being nominated and not winning. And she said, you know, people say to me, oh, you know, you lost the Oscar 13 times, but she's like... I got nominated among hundreds of songs to be in the top five 13 times, and this time I've won it. And I think there's something to be said about like just really being authentic and giving it your all. And you know, like if you're true to what you're doing, that in itself actually is is the biggest payoff. But but over time, I think people will recognise um, that you're that you're authentic and you're doing something because you really 
believe in it. Love it, man. Respect, yeah. And you know, uh, again, one of the things which I respect about you is you're a straight shooter. You tell it how it is. You think about what you're saying, right? He thinks, you can see people's energy, right? He kind of is considering exactly what he's saying. But your history is great. And I love the fact that you had this unconventional approach. And, and I, I know now that you're also working with a company called Verus, which I'd love you to give us a quick download on. And, and just for those people watching here, so people have asked, right? So is this a funding event, which takes place on December 6, 7, and 8, is it um, catered to tech? Is it catered to anything in particular? So the, the answer that I give can confuse some people. It's for entrepreneurs, regardless of the area that they're in, because the, the, the commonalities of the problems that we face, they're called commonalities for a reason. And so the, you've seen different judges tonight and different investors as well. So we will structure it in such a way that the investors which are looking into Web3 will have that focus. Those who are looking maybe into sustainability or environment will have that focus and so on, right? So if you're wondering or worrying or thinking about, is there a place for me? The answer is yes. By the way, I'll add a link in on uh, the different streams that we've got, but you can go to the funding, either the website, the slash dash funding.com, the details are there, or Instagram, uh, the funding show, uh, at the funding show, and you'll find the area there which you can either um, fill out yourself to become a pitcher. If you're interested in becoming an investor, actually, or, or a judge, feel free to get in contact as well, because this is just the beginning, right? Um, and for those of you, you know, who are looking, you know, to find out more, to just to attend on the day, there will be uh, like a general entry ticket as well. Um, that you can come in and be a part of this to see how it all works, um, what happens, who's there, do some networking and all the rest of that. And we may even include some master classes as well. So it will be a really interesting three days, December 6, 7 and 8 at the new Aria Progressive Asian Restaurant. Bit of a mouthful. And that's in Batu Balig, right here in Bali. And look, um, if you're in Bali, you should definitely come. So... Verus, um, tell us a little bit uh, about Verus, and, and then, then we'll, we'll, we'll let you off, and then Wayne, Wayne and I will close. Okay, great. Yeah, so again, in an unconventional way, uh, Verus is a community project, so it's actually not a company. Um, it had no VC backing, no ICO, no founders funds, no dev rewards, so it's basically a community project that a bunch of uh, people like myself have kind of seen this vision and gotten behind and thought that looks like something really interesting um, and r really what it aims to do is to um, kind of evolve the web3 space so that it's available to everyone um, that there aren't the uh, kind of um, like what Julian was referring to before the, the, the kind of predatory um, energies that, that exist in a lot of venture capital that we see um, in crypto, I mean, you know, you, you could say FTX might be an example of that, but, but there's, there's certainly many others. Um, and actually, not glossing over the cracks that I think a lot of the space just kind of says, oh, well, you know, it's early, we'll, we'll fix that in the mix. But actually, looking from a ground up and saying, no, we're going to do things a bit differently um, and, and make this really work at scale. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a um, Web3 protocol that's... Um, fair launch that's credibly neutral, that's available to anyone irrespective of their financial standing or their location. There's actually a lot of people in Indonesia that are mining it on broken Android phones and making, you know, for what in Indonesia is probably um, reasonable income. And um, yeah, and the project is, it has been four and a half years in development and is about to fully hit mainnet, hopefully before the end of this year. Great, brother. Yeah. Round of applause for Brad, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you brother. Thank Appreciate you. it. Mind your step, yeah? Yeah. All right. So we're going to play the... I'm going to shuffle the assist all over. So there's just that one there. Okay. Move this guy over there. Woo. Now, now you can see the little little cushion there. There you go. So to kind of help me uh, with the back. If you can, can close, close up on us. So, guys. So as you mentioned before, uh, this, is, this is Wayne... 
Uh, we, there's one other one, uh, Grover Anastasios, who's busy um, basically making this happen behind the scenes as well. And he's a big uh, venture, venture builder. So you've heard from uh, the different uh, judges, some of them investors. Um, so you get an idea of the fact that this is driven by, it's driven by heart, but it's also a business. It's driven by the fact that Indonesia, if you would have seen recently, uh, there's a great article in The Economist's uh, page. It's a beautiful article. You should read it, The Economist. Um, check it out. Indonesia is going places, guys. Uh, we're here. I, I came not because I thought Indonesia was going places. I came because I was attracted to it um, from a socio point of view, actually, not the economic. And then while I've been here for the six years, I've realized what an incredible position um, Indonesia is in the world. And I've written about this on multiple occasions. Feel free to follow me. You'll see everything there. So what we're doing is really important. It's a way that it's about bridging divide, but bridging gaps. You know, Indonesia has some incredible talent, incredible people, and so how do we unlock that, and how do we share that with the best of people like us? My wife is Indonesian, I have two kids which are Indonesian and, and Australian and soon British, come on, right? Um, I, but I, I'm also a guest, and I'm happy with that, right? But I, but I feel very strongly that there is a way to unite through Binika Tunggul Ika, right? The, the, the unity and diversity, the motto of Indonesia. And that's really where the funding, uh, where Bayamia uh, is coming from. So um, before we begin to uh, wrap this, uh, this particular episode up, by the way, next week we have BBC, Bali Blockchain Center, um, Anta, an incredible guy um, who's heading that one up and is doing amazing things for Indonesians uh, and foreigners living here in Bali. But Wayne, before we begin to wrap up, is there anything um, that you'd like to say or anything you'd like to share? Um, well, first of all, I think um, we should give a lot of uh, a round of applause for everyone that uh, actually came up here and willing to uh, give of their time and their energy to actually, and, and they are all doing amazing things, you know. But to coalesce around a project or a couple of projects, it's really good when you can get everyone together. So, round of applause for everyone, I guess. Um, I think for me, it's uh, just ending uh, uh, by saying that, uh, you know. These projects that we individually uh, have spoken about uh, require um, some form of bravery and sometimes um, we find that um, that's not really there because of the, the psychology of some of the uh, environment that we live in where if you actually try and fail, it's kind of frowned upon. So. Um, when I started this project, I did not know anything about, uh, for instance, media and how to get people to coalesce around the idea itself. But um, I think just by putting it out there, the universe have a way, had a way of kind of just um, putting people in my path and this is where we are at now and I really do believe that it's just the beginning. and. Uh, but with that, I want to just encourage uh, everyone uh, that's watching and, and people that's also not just to follow your heart and go after your dreams. You don't have to know what's around the corner. Best to educate yourself as, as much as possible, but take that leap and go after it. And when you do, just go after it with everything. And, um, you know, really quickly, I, I, I called my mom when I started a project and, and I was talking to her and she said, well, I, I thought you said you weren't gonna do any more stuff in, in business. And I said, yeah, well, uh, I am. Oh, and then she said, well, what do you want? And I said, yeah, I just wanna know if uh, there's a bed uh, there readily available for me and uh, you will sometime cook for me and stuff like that. She said, yeah, you always have to, play. it gave me the freedom to just final, financially just indulge and throw everything at it and just go hard. And um, that's the goal and the mission is clear. And um, yeah, but also I have really good people around me and still soliciting more. And uh, yeah, just go after your dreams and your vision. Round of applause everybody. 
And that's this week's show. See you next week for Bali Blockchain Center. Anta Rapman will be here. Incredible guy with a pretty much all Indonesian panel, except me. <laughs> but it's going to be an amazing show. So look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks to Ichi, who we got over here, IU, and we've got Brother Guzman from Tropical Nomad every week just delivering and helping and supporting this whole mission and this whole movement. So thank you to all of the guests, Mark, Alex, I can see you. Uh, who else we got here? Josie, Sarita, Brother Brad, Giuliano over there, otherwise known as Julian, <laughs> and everyone else who came on. Really uh, appreciate you. Thank you so much, Brother Alex. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank Bye you. Guys.